Serial killers. We've all heard of them and most of them are men. John Wayne Gacy, Richard Ramirez, Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy to name a few. But when we think of female serial killers, usually the first one that comes to mind is Eileen Warnos. Warnos claims she started killing men for the past abuse and sexual violence she endured while moonlighting as a prostitute. After she started her killing spree, she began to kill any man willing to pick her up, some completely innocent, just feeling sorry for her and offering her a ride. This gave her the moniker Monster and caused her own demise as she was executed in a Florida prison in 2002 by lethal injection. The electric chair, Old Sparky, was replaced by lethal injection in Florida after 1999. Then there's Martha Beck, one of the Lonely Hearts killers. She probably never would have murdered anyone without her partner, Raymond Fernandez. Together, they made a lethal killing team, and it was Martha who initiated their first kill. She killed for financial gain, but it was the jealous love for Ray that would cause her to viciously attack her victims. Martha and Ray were eventually arrested, tried, and convicted for first-degree murder for the death of Janet Fay. In 1951, they were both sentenced to death and executed at Sing Sing Prison in New York. Judy Buenoano was a sadistic sociopath labeled the Black Widow. Judy was more evil than Warnos and Beck combined. She targeted her own family who probably loved and trusted her, yet unsuspecting of her intentions. Greed and money was her motivating drive to kill. Judy poisoned a husband, several boyfriends, and even her own son. After getting them to sign life insurance policies, she fed them vitamin capsules laced with arsenic. Her son managed to survive the poisoning attempt, only later to be drowned in a river by his own mother. It took years before she finally made the mistake that would seal her fate, after she rigged a bomb to her boyfriend's car in an attempt to blow him up, and the police became suspicious of her. A little background on Judy, she was born Judius Welty in 1943 in Quanah, Texas. Her mother died when Judy was only four and she went to live with her paternal grandparents. When Judy turned 14, she reunited with her newly married father and moved to New Mexico. She claims that she was abused emotionally and physically by both her father and her stepmother. Because of this, she began to cause trouble and lash out towards family members. She started attacking her stepmother and one time she attacked her stepbrothers by pouring hot grease on both of them, injuring them severely. Because of her violent behavior, her father called the police and had her arrested. She was sentenced to jail for 60 days. After she completed her sentence, she went before the judge who gave her two options. She could go back home to live with her father, or she could attend reform school. She chose reform school. In 1959, at the age of 16, she graduated from the school. This is where Judy's deviant lifestyle began. After graduating reform school, Judy moved back to Texas to pursue a career in nursing. But soon, she would meet a man and become pregnant, but the father wanted nothing to do with the situation, so she would have the baby and raise him alone, that is until 1962 when she met James Goodyear. She soon married James Goodyear and he even adopted Michael. Eventually, Judy and James had two other children, a son named James and a daughter named Kimberly. Judy and James would later move their family to Orlando, Florida in 1967, where she opened a daycare center. A few years later, and because James was in the Air Force, he was stationed in Vietnam for a year until 1971. After he returned home, Judy began giving him vitamin C capsules laced with arsenic. Soon, James began to complain with severe stomach pains and admitted himself into the hospital. But when the doctors failed to discover what was wrong with James, they ordered him back home to get some rest. James would die shortly afterwards. 
Because he was previously given a clean bill of health by military doctors, and the doctors at home could not pinpoint what was making him sick, no one expected the wiser that he was being poisoned by Judy. Judy waited several days before cashing in on James's insurance policy in the amount of $53,000. Then, less than two months later, her house would mysteriously burn down, and she collected a huge payout of $90,000. In 1972, Judy decided to leave Orlando and move her family near Pensacola, Florida to a town called Milton, my hometown, and where serial killer Martha Beck is from, too. Here, she met Bobby Joe Morris, who became her boyfriend. Shortly after moving to Milton, Judy began to complain that her oldest son, Michael, was becoming too hard to handle and she placed him into foster care. In 1977, Judy moved to Colorado with Bobby Joe and her two other children. A few months later, Bobby Joe began having severe stomach pains and admitted himself into the hospital after he had been taking Judy's vitamin C capsules. And just like Goodyear, doctors could find nothing wrong with Bobby Joe and sent him home with orders to rest. One week later, Bobby Joe collapsed while eating dinner and dropped dead from a heart attack. Judy collected on three separate life insurance policies on Bobby Joe which benefited her financially well. After Bobby Joe's death, she returned to Florida and opened a beauty salon. She began to focus on her children and even Michael returned home from foster care. However, she claimed Michael only continued to be a problem and that she could not handle him. In 1979, when Michael turned 18, he enlisted in the Army, but would soon fall ill. Military physicians this time would not fail to find out why Michael was sick. They found potent levels of arsenic in his system. Although they were able to save his life, the arsenic caused irreversible damage to his body, causing significant muscle atrophy of his arms and legs. He was declared disabled, discharged from the army, and sent home. From that point on, for the rest of his life, he would rely on heavy leg braces weighing him down an extra 60 pounds and a walker just to get around. My question is, if the army found high levels of arsenic in his system, why wouldn't they suspect that someone may have been poisoning him? That's the million dollar question, right? If anybody knows the answer to that, uh, put it in the comments. So moving on, a few months later, Judy took both of her sons, James and Michael, to the East River in Holly, Florida, for a canoe trip in May of 1980. Judy caused the canoe to overturn, making it look like an accident, and Michael with his heavy leg braces sunk straight to the bottom and drowned. Judy and her other son survived the ordeal and were pulled to safety by some boaters on the water out fishing. When she boarded their boat, she told them that her oldest son had drowned. Then, she asked one of the men for a beer. This time, she succeeded in killing her son. Michael Goodyear was only 19. I don't know what is worse, a slow, agonizing death by poisoning or slow, agonizing death by drowning. But at the hands of your own flesh and blood mother, it's just unbelievably cruel and evil. When Judy killed her son, this revealed how diabolically cruel she really was. In reality, she was a wolf in sheep's clothing that went unnoticed by family and doctors. Because who kills their family for profit? Judy, that's who. There is no way she had the ability of empathy or unconditional love. But even after this tragedy, local authorities still didn't even question Judy and wrote it up as an accident. 
Again, I ask, once they fished his body from the river, could they not see this boy had 60-pound braces attached to his legs and wonder why his mother would take him to the water and paddle him out in a canoe, one of the easiest boats a person can tip without even trying? I mean, really? However, the Army officials did not believe her story after she collected yet again on another life insurance policy, and this time on her own son. The Army began to put two and two together and came up with one possible theory. Judy just may have tried to kill her own son, but how could they prove it? In this case, too bad common sense alone couldn't have arrested her when her son died, so she could no longer try to harm anyone else close to her for the almighty dollar, which to her was all that mattered. The new boyfriend, I dub the the lucky B word that rhymes with plastered. And I mean this as a term of endearment because he survived Judy twice and the reason she was finally busted. John Gentry was the inadvertent salvation to bringing Judy down. And I am thankful he not only survived this evil person, but also led to her arrest and conviction. Since her first husband's death, a house fire, three more payouts on a dead boyfriend, and now a dead son, Judy had profited well by now in just the last few years. This is when Judy would change her name from Goodyear to Buenoano, which translated in Spanish meaning good year. To her and her crazy demented mind, all the money she collected pointed to the fact she had a good year. Actually, because she was able to elude suspicion for many years, she had good years from the profits she made from collecting on all the payouts on her dead loved ones. At first, and I am sure it was a ploy to gain Gentry's trust and make him believe she cared so much about him, she spent a lot of money on expensive, extravagant gifts and took him on luxurious vacations. Then later, got him to sign on. You got it. Another life insurance policy. It would be the second attempt on his life and a lie by Judy, later revealed to Gentry, that would finally get him to work with the now suspecting authorities and that Judy just may be killing her family and those closest to her for profit. Ah, the plot thickens. Aside from killing her son in a different manner, other than death by poison, yet not from lack of trying, he was killed by drowning instead. Keep this in mind as I further the story. Gentry, not murdered by Judy, which I am sure was a huge disappointment for her, was also initially being poisoned by arsenic, but the second he noticed he was feeling sick, he stopped and got better. It wasn't until Judy came up with an elaborate lie of telling Gentry she was pregnant with his baby that she attempted yet another unorthodox method by trying to blow the poor guy up to bitsies when poisoning didn't work. Once she told him this great news that they were expecting, Gentry became so excited he immediately wanted to go into town to the liquor store to purchase some hooch to celebrate. And Judy knew at some point he would want to drive his car again. So what does Judy do? Judy does what she does best and tries to kill him again and rigs his car to explode when he cranks the ignition. But when the car explodes, he survives that too. Actually, Gentry was smarter, or at least more observant, than the first two men in Judy's life, and here's why. Once he was given the same vitamin capsules she gave the first two men and began to feel sick, he stopped taking them immediately. Plus, he noticed with full awareness that he felt better. But at that time, Gentry had no reason to believe that Judy was trying to kill him and would be completely oblivious that they were laced with arsenic. He probably just thought it was a disagreement with his system, like an allergic reaction from the capsules themselves. It wasn't until the attempted whacking with the car explosion, and he also learned Judy had been sterilized since 1975, that he, he would start to question her motives. Because the police were now investigating the car bombing, they started with the person who was closest to him, and if she would have anything to gain in the event of his death. The question to that was not only yes, because of the life insurance policy, but a pattern began to emerge when they learned of the other family member deaths in Judy's life and how much money she profited from those deaths. Now with Gentry cooperating and wanting to help, the police obtained a search warrant to search Judy's home and beauty salon. 
They found the vitamins, which later tested positive for arsenic and formaldehyde, an ingredient they confiscated from her beauty salon. And for the grand finale, some of the bomb-making materials, the very same ones used in the car explosion, were also found in Judy's possession, and Judy was busted. The police arrested Judy for the attempted murder of John Gentry, which she made bail for. She was also indicted for a grand theft insurance scam. However, the police had bigger fish to fry and were not finished with her yet. In 1984, Judy was indicted for first-degree murder in the death of her son, Michael, and was tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. Then, exhumations were ordered by authorities to exhume the bodies of both James Goodyear and Bobby Joe Morris to have their bodies autopsied. Arsenic was found in both bodies, and Judy was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for the murder of James Goodyear. Judy is even linked to two other deaths in Alabama, one boyfriend in 1974 and another one in 1980. While on death row, nearing the date of her execution, she proclaimed that she wanted to make sure her grandson grew up thinking his grandmother was innocent. Judy never admitted guilt, even with the mounting evidence surrounding her obvious guilt. But that's the telltale signs of a true sociopath. Judy's last meal was broccoli, asparagus, and strawberries. When asked if she had any last words, she replied no, and she kept her eyes tightly shut as they strapped her into Old Sparky so she wouldn't have to see the faces of the family members of the men she killed. Judy died on March 30, 1998, and was the first woman to be executed in Florida since 1848. She killed her family for profit. Each one was a dollar sign to her, nothing more. It doesn't get more evil than that. They don't get more evil than Judy.